Those of you that have been following along know that over the past several weeks we've been working on a project to make a type of yeast produce spider silk, and probably recognize this roadmap. There are all sorts of tricks and techniques we'll need to make it through this project, and so today we're going to focus on one of them, and simultaneously take a step or two forward on the project. Together, all of these techniques are known as molecular biology, and as many of you have pointed out, all of this is a bit alien to most of you. So we're going to go through the first of these techniques in as much detail as I can, but know for the sake of the video I'm going to have to leave out some details. I'll put some links to more resources in the description, and know that I'm working on an intro to biology video to help people get started and explore the various resources for learning about all of this. So without further ado, let's jump right in. We'll actually be jumping a step and skipping DNA extraction and looking at a process called PCR. PCR lets us take a DNA sample and copy out just the piece of the sequence we want and amplify it so we've got millions of copies. The reason we're skipping DNA extraction is because we're still fine-tuning the protocol for that to maximize the amount of DNA we get out of our samples, so we'll come back to that in a week or two. There are a few parts to PCR which can be broken into primer design, running the reaction, and testing the results. But first let's go over how PCR works. PCR stands for Polymerase Chain Reaction. To perform the reaction we mix a few things in a tube and load it into a special machine. We add the DNA we want to amplify, also known as the DNA template, a DNA copying enzyme, individual DNA letters called DNTPs or deoxynucleotide triphosphates, and then two short single-stranded pieces of DNA called primers, which we'll talk about more in a moment, but for now suffice it to say that they mark the start and end of the piece of DNA we want to amplify. We call the primer that sticks to the front the forward primer and the one that sticks to the end the reverse primer. The secret sauce that makes this work is that DNA copying enzyme. The original enzyme used in PCR is called TAC polymerase and was isolated from bacteria that live near deep sea vents on the ocean floor. This is important because unlike most enzymes that break if you heat them up, TAC evolved in very hot conditions and so it can handle being heated to nearly the boiling point of water without issue, and you'll see why this is necessary in a moment. Over the years other enzymes from different bacteria were found and even engineered and they've largely replaced TAC for more delicate forms of PCR. But when PCR is being used as an analytical tool and you don't care about the quality of the DNA that it produces, TAC is still the go-to enzyme as it's very cheap. We run the reaction in a device called a thermocycler. Basically, it raises and lowers the temperature of the mixture so that different parts of the reaction happen in sequence. First, we heat everything up really hot to 95 degrees Celsius. This causes the DNA to melt and the two strands to separate. This is also why we need a thermostable enzyme or this step would destroy it. Then we cool things down to a lower temperature called the annealing temperature. At these temperatures, the primers will stick to the now separated DNA strands. This sticking of the primers to its complementary sequence on the DNA template is called hybridization. Finally, we raise the temperature up again to 72 degrees, and at this temperature, the DNA copying enzyme becomes active. It grabs onto the annealed primer and extends the strand using free-floating DNTPs in the solution, synthesizing a complementary strand to the template DNA. This is known as extension or elongation. To review, there are four DNA letters consisting of the molecules adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, or AGCT for short, and they always come in complementary pairs across from each other. They're made of a sugar phosphate backbone and one of the four bases I just mentioned. A always sticks to T and G always sticks to C, and vice versa. So as new DNA is made, anytime there's an A on the strand being copied, a T is added. Anytime there's a C, a G is added, and so on. Another important thing to keep in mind is that DNA has a direction to it, and the enzymes can only add new DNTPs in one direction. Each strand has what we call the 3' prime and 5' prime end, and the two strands stick to each other in opposite directions. When DNA is copied, it grows from the 5' prime to 3' prime end. Once the extension step is done, the machine heats up again to 95 degrees, which once again causes all the double-stranded DNA to separate, including our newly made pieces. Then the cycle starts over, primers stick, new DNA is made, things melt apart, etc, etc. In the first few cycles, you end up with bits of DNA that start or stop where you want, but extend too far one way or the other. This is because primers only stick to one spot each, so there's nothing to tell the enzyme when to stop copying. But as you keep doing this, you start ending up with pieces that either only start where the starting primer stuck, or only end where the end primer stuck. Let's look at a specific example. Let's say you have a strand that the forward primer stuck to. One of the halves is the original DNA template and extends in both directions, but the half that the primer stuck to only starts where the primer annealed. When it melts apart, a forward primer will stick to the original half again, and a reverse primer will stick to the new half. Let's ignore the half that the forward primer stuck to. When the reverse primer sticks and the DNA is extended in the 3' prime direction, you end up with a piece of DNA that is exactly the part you want, because once it hits the end of the sequence, there's nothing more for it to copy, and the enzyme just falls off. 
Now when this strand melts and a new primer sticks, the only thing that can be copied is the part you want. Because the reaction is full of primers, this massively favors these perfect pieces, as more and more of them start to form and get copied exponentially. Another thing that helps is that we know how fast the enzyme adds new letters as it makes new DNA, so we set the thermocycler to only be at the extension temperature for the amount of time it's going to take to make the piece we want. That way we don't end up with many of the initial overextended copies that are too long and waste reagents. Okay, now that we know how this works, let's start with primer design. To do that, I'm using an online tool called Genome Compiler, though there's other pieces of software that'll do the same thing. I just like this one because the UI is nice and it's free to use. Another common software is SnapGene, but the license for that is rather expensive. To get started, we need to load in the DNA sequence we'll be working with. In previous videos, I've shown these, which are plasmid maps. Basically, they're the zoomed out versions of a piece of DNA that's been labeled so you know what everything is without having to look at the individual letters. Think of it like an overview of a computer program. I've already gone ahead and loaded in the GFP yeast plasmid we looked at in an earlier video into Genome Compiler. If you don't have the DNA sequence, but it exists in the NCBI or iGEM databases, there's a search function that lets you import it directly into the program, which we'll look at in a moment. The piece we're interested in is the G418 resistance gene. We want to copy it out so that way we can put it into our main PKLAC2 plasmid, so that when we make our spider yeast, we can select them using G418 as the antibiotic. So we need to design the primers that will stick to the start and end of this sequence. Let's look at the start of the sequence. The first thing to notice is these three letters, A, T, G. DNA is divided into three letter segments called codons that code for different amino acids. Here Genome Compiler shows the amino acid sequence underneath. ATG codes for an amino acid called methionine, but methionine is also what's called the start codon. After the DNA is copied into RNA and the RNA is going to be translated into protein, ATG is always the spot where translation starts. So almost all proteins, at least when they're first made, start with a methionine. The point being is that this marks the start of the G418 resistance protein, so this is where we want to start our primer. Once we know that, we just highlight the sequence starting there and extend anywhere from 15 to 25 letters further. The way we decide on exactly how long it should be is the numbers down at the bottom here. These are the theoretical melting point, or the temperature at which the primers will stick or hybridize. We want a melting point of around 62 degrees, but a few degrees in either direction is fine. This is also how we know which temperature to set the thermocycler to. The other number is the GC content. The more Gs and Cs we have, the higher the melting point will be, but also the stickier the primer will be. Too high of a GC content and the primer won't come off properly. So we want less than 60% GC content ideally, though there are ways of changing the reaction itself to accommodate this if you don't have other options. And finally, we want what's called a GC clamp, which is a G or C on the last letter or two of the primer, to promote stronger bonding and give a nice sticky end to make sure it adheres properly but not too many or it won't come off during the denaturation or melting step. So two to three of the last five is ideal. Just a quick note about why G's and C's are stickier and affect the melting point so much. The reason is the hydrogen bonds that hold the various letters to each other. You can see here that G's and C's form three hydrogen bonds, while A's and T's only form two. So it takes more energy to separate a G from a C than an A from a T, which also translates to a higher melting point. With that done, we do the same thing on the reverse primer, but keeping in mind, we're looking at the other strand now. Just like before, the end of the sequence is marked by a stop codon. In this case, the letters TAA, but there's actually a few different potential stop codons. Once that's done, we can simulate our reaction by going to the primers menu and clicking generate PCR product and selecting our newly designed primers. The reason we do this is because sometimes when you design primers, they can accidentally stick to something they're not supposed to if they're too similar to another sequence or they may stick to each other and form what's called a primer dimer. Both of these are bad, so by simulating we can essentially check and make sure that won't happen. Another thing that can go wrong is a hairpin, where the primer can bend back on itself and stick to itself, making it totally useless. Genome Compiler doesn't check for most of this, but it does give you the option to be redirected to a site called Primer3, which does. But when we ran ours, it shows only a single perfect product. Now, for most PCR reactions, this is where it ends. You can now take the primers we designed and send them to a DNA synthesis company, and they'll chemically synthesize them for you. In our case, we used a company called AlphaDNA, but there's lots of others including Sigma Aldrich, Thermo Fisher, and many, many more. Some will only ship to labs and universities, though, so check each site to find out. AlphaDNA will ship to anyone, and they're local to Montreal, which is why we chose them. However, for our PCRs, we're doing something a bit different. Since we'll be using a process called Gibson Assembly to put our newly grown fragments into our plasmid, we have more design work to do, and our primers need to be much longer, but we'll save that for the Gibson video. 
but I mention it here because our annealing temperature is much higher than what I just showed because of that. Another thing you can do with PCR primers is intentionally put the wrong letter in one or two places. This introduces a mutation in the final DNA and is a way of slightly tweaking things, but that's beyond the scope of this video. Finally, before we get to doing our reactions, we can do the same thing with our silk sequence, but instead of loading in the DNA from a file, we look up the sequence in the NCBI database. In our case, I had looked it up earlier, so I know the name of the sequence to look up, but if you just know the name of the gene or protein you want, you can search it here and see what shows up. Once you've ordered the primers and they arrive, we can get working in the lab. For this, we'll need some PCR tubes, which are small, sterile tubes that have very thin walls to help them change temperature quickly. We'll also need some source DNA, some buffer, which is the solution the reaction takes place in, the DNTPs, our primers, and then the DNA copying enzyme. The buffer maintains the correct pH and contains magnesium ions, which are needed for the DNA enzyme to function. In a future video, we'll look at what happens if you mess with the buffer and add a small amount of manganese, which will purposely make the enzyme make mistakes. This is one way to make mutants of a gene. In terms of enzymes, there's a huge assortment to choose from. As I mentioned, the classic is TAC, and we'll be using that in a future video, but it has some serious drawbacks. Primarily, it can only reliably amplify fairly short pieces of DNA of a thousand base pairs or less. More than that, and it starts making errors. So the enzyme you choose is based on what you're trying to do. Since we'll be trying to amplify large pieces of DNA, and we want the sequence to be perfect, we'll be using one called Q5, which can amplify stretches of DNA up to 10,000 base pairs long without error, or 20,000 with the occasional error. Some other common ones include PFU and deep vent polymerase. There are great resources online to help you choose an enzyme. To make our mix, we add a small amount of each primer to the tube, as well as a few nanograms worth of the template DNA, though the amount of DNA solution you add will vary based on the concentration. Since we're doing a bunch of reactions in this clip, we made a tube of master mix that contains our buffer, enzyme, and DNTPs. In this case, we diluted the 5x buffer to 1x and added enough DNTPs so that their final concentration was 200 micromolar, as well as 0.6 microliters of the Q5 enzyme for a final volume of 60 microliters. Then we add 15 microliters of this mix to each of our reactions. Once that's done, we close up the tubes and load them into our thermocycler. Next, we set the parameters of the machine. Our settings were heat at 95C for 4 minutes, heat at 95C for another 30 seconds, drop the temp to 68C for the primer annealing for 30 seconds, raise the temp to 72 for extension for 3 minutes, and then cycle back to step 2 20 times. Finally, we do one last extension step to make sure there's no weird single-stranded stuff, then the machine drops to 4C for storage until someone can unload the machine and throw the tubes into the freezer until we can test them. And that's pretty much all there is to it, just load up the machine and let it run. All that's left is to test the results, and to do that we run a gel. We've talked about running a gel in a previous video briefly, and we'll do a more in-depth video about it soon. But the TLDR is that we put a sample of our PCR reaction into a block of gel made of a material called agarose, and then use electricity to pull it through the gel from the top to the bottom. Next to our test we run a control sample, called a ladder, made of pieces of DNA of known size. The gel's been stained with a dye that binds to DNA, so we can see it when we shine a UV light on it. Smaller pieces of DNA move through the gel faster and end up closer to the bottom by the time we turn off the electricity. We can then compare how far our DNA sample moves through the gel relative to the ladder, and from that we can see the size of any piece of DNA that got amplified. If they're the right size, then our PCR was successful. So what was the result of our latest PCR reactions? Well, let's start with the G418. Here you see three identical bands from three different tests we ran at different annealing temperatures. The ladder is a 100 base pair ladder, so the lowest rung is 100 base pairs and the highest is 1000. Our band is a few rungs from the top, meaning it's about 850 base pairs long, which is exactly the length we were expecting. This means our reaction was a success, and we now have one of the two genes we need to build our spider silk plasmid. We can now directly use this and build our empty plasmid, which we've called PKLAC G418, and we'll look at that process in an upcoming video. Funnily enough, the first time we ran this successfully was on that tube that we talked about last week that all tests seemed to show had no DNA in it, and yet it was successful when we ran PCR on it. So that means that there was actually a tiny amount of DNA, and our reagents on our first PCR reaction just weren't good. But, there was so little that our meter couldn't pick it up. So while it wasn't pure water, it was pretty close. The reason this worked is because PCR is incredibly sensitive and only needs the tiniest whiff of DNA to work, as once a copy is made, it's amplified exponentially. So there was probably only about 1 nanogram per microliter or less in the solution, rather than the 100 nanogram per microliter that was claimed. Still useless for transforming yeast, but enough that we could isolate the gene we wanted. We also tried it on some DNA extracts that we prepared with similar results. And how about our silk? 
Well, thus far our attempts haven't worked, but that's likely due to our DNA extraction procedure. Insects are some of the harder samples to extract DNA from, so until we can get a good, high-quality extract, we won't have enough DNA for our primers to stick to. We started with a really basic DNA extraction procedure meant for E. coli, just to see what we'd get, and the results were atrocious. So this week we'll spend our time using a much improved insect-specific protocol which should radically improve our yield. Once that's sorted, we'll try the PCR again and should have our silk gene. If that doesn't solve the issue, then it's a problem with our primers and we'll make a new set that doesn't have the extra Gibson stuff and do this as a two-step procedure where we first isolate the gene, then run it again to add the Gibson ends. And if that fails, we'll completely redesign them so they stick somewhere else. Not a big deal, just part of the scientific process. So be sure to stay tuned for more updates. And with that, it's time to finish up this episode. I know that was a ton of information, so I've included links in the description to more resources. I really hope you enjoyed, and if you did, be sure to subscribe, and most importantly, ring that bell to see when I post new videos, and share the videos far and wide. As always, a massive thank you to my patrons and channel members who make these videos possible. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.